Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rabadi and Company Fireside Chat with LSB Industries. I'm Spencer Sibeli, an analyst here. Um, I'm just going to read some important disclosures and, and then we'll get right into the call. Um, please be advised that this event is being recorded. This presentation is for information purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice or solicitation to invest. Past performance does not indicate future results. Investing involves risk, including loss of principal. Rabadi Securities LLC is a member of FINRA slash SIPC. Rabadi and Company Advisors LLC is an SEC registered investment advisor. Um, we will also be doing a Q&A section at the end after Bob and, and Mark Berman, the CEO, uh, talk for a bit. So please just submit your questions uh, at the Q&A box on the, on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and yeah, so Bob, Mark, you guys want to take it away? Appreciate it. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us. <clears throat> so the purpose today, the fortunate to have Mark Bierman here, uh, CEO of LSB Industries, is really to kind of help people focus on like the 36,000 uh, foot view here, right? The LSB as a corporation has substantially changed and it's been a huge evolution. And we think that today it's really an interesting company that's extremely well positioned, that has a very different fact pattern. So it really has been a transformation. And so that's what I really want to do, talk about what that transformation is, what we think is a huge opportunity set in terms of valuation being very discounted, a strong balance sheet, a huge opportunity set in front of it. They've already done things that need to transform the business and our position to really be continued to be opportunistic and grow from here. So with that, I'm going to ask Mark to start. And I asked him to give a little history. And that probably even starts in 2014 when the two of us had breakfast in a little diner in Oklahoma <laughs> City, and Mark had just joined the company. So, uh, you know, I have the good fortune of knowing Mark for a long time and have history here. Thanks, Bob, and good morning. Um, so Bob's right. Um, I remember that breakfast uh, in Beverly's right? <laughs> in Oklahoma City. Um, so, I, you know, my background uh, for uh, almost 30 years uh, actually was an investment banker. Um, oh, well, and then you did something honest for a change. That's okay. true. Okay. Um, but um, I got to see a lot of uh, different businesses uh, almost exclusively in the industrial sector. Um, LSB actually was a client of mine for 10 years. And in 2014, I joined with the idea that um, within a year, I would transition into CFO. Um, at the time, uh, <laughs> kind of an interesting story at the time, uh, that I between the time I accepted and the time that I actually walked in the door, um, we had an activist situation. Mm -hmm. um, Starbird uh, approached the company. Um, the company really didn't know how to deal with that particular situation. And I spent six months uh, working with Credit Suisse on, uh, on dealing with our activists. Um, and so that was the first six months. But you know, until I became CFO, which happened in mid-2015, um, I led investor relations and then started a corporate development effort. Um, in 2015, uh, June of 2015, I took over as chief financial officer. And just for some background, the company um, had announced a very large expansion project at our largest facility, which is in El Dorado, Arkansas, where they were going to build a brand new ammonia plant, brand new um, large nitric acid plant, uh, nitric acid concentrator, cogen facility, and then some infrastructure. And the original budget was $520 million, um, which was a large project for the company. Um, and I would say two weeks after I took over as chief financial officer, I realized that there was a cost overrun. Um, I think people were surprised at first and the original cost overrun after two weeks was maybe 50 or $60 million. So the company had a balance sheet that could support it. Um, more digging, um, more digging. And unfortunately, um, the deficit grew larger and larger. Right. Um, there was a change of management in September of 2015. Uh, the board decided to make a change at the CEO level and we had um, a board member that came off to be interim CEO, and then after three months, he became permanent CEO. So he and I went off um, to really figure out how are we going to refinance uh, the project, shut down the project, what we're going to do, right? And so, so let me stop for a moment and put that a little bit in context from an industry point of view. So the industry saw opportunities to build that capacity. So uh, there may have been specific issues with LSB, probably for sure, but there was industry-wide issues, right? This isn't, this isn't CF doing the Donaldsonville, and there's the yeah. cost overrun is tremendous. So, so all these things were somewhat part of the process where the industry got a little ahead of itself and it was expansion and all these kind of things. Yes, I would but, say that, so, so two points on it. The basic premise of us doing the project basically um, producing ammonia versus buying ammonia 
was spot on. It made a lot of sense. Right. Um, the industry um, back in 20, uh, 2012, 13, saw that natural gas prices, which is the primary feedstock right. for ammonia, right. really um, were starting to drop precipitously. Uh, primary reason was fracking. Right. Um, so lots of expansion. There were probably 36, and this is important for a conversation I'm sure we'll have later, but 36 different ammonia plants announced uh, new builds, expansions, all in that 2012-2015 time frame. Um, at the end of the day, seven got done. Mm -hmm. uh, we were one of seven, and everyone had cost overruns. Right. Um, everyone else could support it with their balance sheet. We unfortunately okay. couldn't. Okay. And, and, and let me digress again there too. The concept made a huge amount of sense. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's where we are today. Yeah. That that opportunity and that differentiation is substantial and identifiable and quantifiable, and that's part of why. The cash flows that you have today are there and probably sustainable. So the concept was right. Absolutely. The execution, you know, was too many people in the door at the same time. So uh, yeah, it's, I think project management. Um, okay. Company had done smaller projects, um, five hundred and twenty million dollar complex project yeah, right, right. needed a whole different level of, of oversight and management. Yeah, right. And I think you know it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, but probably could have been done differently. Right. right? right. Um, so you know, fast forward, uh, we, we build out this facility, and before we do that. Um, as I said, we had to really determine um, when they made a change of CEO, did it make sense to continue or how are we going to fund the gap that we had right. in the cost of the project? So we looked at selling a facility. We actually had another business. A company had a, a very good um, and profitable um, uh, HVAC business. They were a manufacturer of specialty HVAC products. Right. And so we looked at, could we sell that? And, you know, again, my previous work, um, pointed me to the direction, and I had relationships with folks that were obvious buyers. Um, would we sell another plant? Could we do a structured financing? And ultimately, um, everyone knew that the company was in poor shape and tried to take advantage of it, right? So selling assets wasn't going to make sense because right. we were giving them away. Right. So we did a structured financing at the end of 2015, where we raised $210 million of preferred stock and another $50 million in um, tack on notes to the publicly traded debt that we had outstanding. Right. Um, and that was done with a group called Eldridge Industries. Um, and away we went, we finished the project. Um, actually the buy, the potential buyers and the likely buyers of the HVAC business then came back and said, okay, we're only kidding. We'll give you a, a fair value uh, for that business. And we wound up selling it in mid 2016 uh, for about 13 times trend we gave it us. So it was a really good transaction for us. But at that point, then we were solely uh, a nitrogen chemical player. Um, the plan came up um, right before we sold that HVAC business in 2016, that the ammonia plant. The rest of the plants had come up in uh, late 2015. And so now everything was up and running, and we were working kinks out like you would do in any store, though. Um, so at that point, you know, we looked at the assets and said, you know, one, we have a holding company because I had a lot of businesses at one point in time. So we need to collapse the holding company, save on expenses and rationalize all the expenses. And then the company really had gotten into the, the nitrogen chemical business through a series of acquisitions and never integrated those plants. So they really ran standalone. There was no um, EVP of manufacturing. There was no common logistics, no common procurement right. uh, or consolidated, anything like that. And I, I liken it to uh, we were now private equity investors that bought a family-owned business in a public arena. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so we went off to do that. Um, along the way, I think the board um, you know, wanted to see uh, whether selling the business made sense or not. Um, so we actually ran a process. Um, we had some interested folks, but quite frankly, the assets were not running very well and were not very efficient. And the prices that we got um, for the company we're not very attractive. Right. So we made the decision at that point to really pull back and roll up our sleeves and really hunker down and focus on turning around the business. Um, at the end of, uh, I'd say mid 2018, towards end of 2018, um, you know, I had already started to, to get involved more in the business as more COO than okay. state government, um, although still retain the CFO title. At the end of 2018, um, the CEO that they put in place uh, decided that um, his contract was up and it was time for him to, to go home. He had never moved to Oklahoma City and to do something different. So the board asked me to step up uh, and take the CEO role, which I was flattered. 
But um, I really wanted to have a conversation with the board, which I think they were surprised about. Um, and I have a great relationship with our board, and I did at that time too. But the real focus was, look, um, you want to sell the company? You know, we can do that. It's kind of unexciting. But I think there's a lot of value creation by turning around this company. But it's going to take two to three years, four years to do that. We need to get our manufacturing rates up, right? Because in the chemical business, or, or quite frankly, in the petrochemical business, Anytime you have big plants like that, you have a lot of really sunken fixed costs, a lot of fixed costs that whether you make one ton or 400,000 tons need to be spread out, right? Um, so getting rates up made we were more reliable, but also more profitable. Right? So we went off, the board was very supportive of that, said we get it, you know, go, go off and turn around the company. Um, I would say over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, um, we wound up uh, changing over, or I wound up changing over a, a bunch of the senior management right. team and the next level. Right. Um, and, you know, my philosophy really, as you know, Bob, it, it is really flat organization, no politics, um, and really just get things done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's hurdles in every part of the business, and we got to figure out, you know, how do we get around those hurdles or jump over them or run through them or whatever it's going to be. Right. And so that's what we did. So, um, you know, we were, I went out and uh, with the help of others and some board members recruited some really great um, senior leaders at the company, right. um, people that are really great at what they do. Right. Um, and my job is to really provide guidance and support and the resources right. to get that done. Right. So we did that. If you, if, you know, kind of point of reference in 2017, uh, 2018, our operating rates for our ammonia plants, since everything starts with the production of ammonia, um, were between 75 and 80 percent, which is really poor. Mm -hmm. um, the last three years, uh, we've run between 90 and 92 percent, and there's still more room to improve, and that's our real focus. Where we want to be is 95 percent con consistently. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of low-hanging fruit in the beginning uh, mm -hmm. to increase that rate. Not much low-hanging fruit left. What it really is, it's not a lot of capital. It's not, you know, we've got to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get there, but you have to put in the right policies, procedures, PM programs, preventative maintenance program that, you know, have a really fulsome work order management system, right? Because that really drives everything. And it's really just blocking and tackling to get it done. And so, you know, you won't see going from low 90s just to 95%. Every year, we should see some incremental improvement for the next couple of years to get there. Right? Um, so we did that first. Um, then the commercial strategy came next because you can't produce the product. You don't have product to sell. Right? Um, historically, I think the company was really focused on selling tons and less focused on maximizing price. Right. Don't know why. Right. Um, and we're all about uh, optimizing our production. Right. So we can sell, um, as most people know, half of our business we sell is fertilizer uh, or half of our production. The other half is non-fertilizer, either as um, an, a feedstock for an industrial product right. or into the mining industry. Right. Our commercial team really needs to optimize the product as to which where we're going to get the better pricing in each of those markets. Right. Um, so I brought in someone to lead that. He's done a phenomenal job, right. as has our head of manufacturing, right. to really change the whole complexion of our commercial strategy. Um, once we did that, and that occurred, I'd say, uh, 20 and in, in, uh, in the first half of 2021, um, you know, pricing started to really improve in our industry, which is, of course, important. Um, but the, the whole financial complexion of the company changed. Um, we were then able to convert uh, that preferred that I referred to, um, you know, sat down with the preferred holder, talked about um, where we're going and where the growth opportunities right. are. And they were really excited about that. So they were happy to convert right. into equity. Uh, that unlocked, um, you know, value there because the credit agencies, uh, credit rating agencies really looked at that preferred as debt. And uh, then we were able to go and refinance the balance sheet in September of 21 and lower our uh, interest rate by almost 350 basis points. So, so, so that, that's a critical thing in my mind. T today, the company financially is a very different company than it's been. Yes. And so therefore, and, and people may even know the company and say, oh, I know that company. They don't, right? So therefore, the, the balance sheet today is really something that enables you to have all those operational advantages, to have that cost advantage of being in North America to really execute on that, right? Absolutely. Right. And what cost, what's the balance sheet look like today? Yeah, so we've got $700 million of gross debt, but we've got $450 million or so yeah. of cash on the balance sheet. Who would have thought you'd say that? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, right. right. I remember when we had 50 right. or 60. Right. 
products. Um, so it's been a, a tremendous transformation financially. Um, you know, even though last year was over 400 million, now we have some unprecedented pricing, right. but we're still, you know, base EBITDA okay. for our business is $200 million, right. plus or minus a little, depending on turnarounds and things like that. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so the market cap and the the market is not recognizing that fact. The valuation is clearly very discounted, given that kind of worst case situation in terms of what cash flows are generating. Well, we believe so. For sure. Right. <laughs> and that makes sense because people have ideas. And the other thing is, of course, there's so many moving parts in your business. Right. Pricing has moved, and of course, the last year it's accentuated all those things. Right. You pointed out last year was a phenomenal year, and uh, you you know may not be it's clearly not going to be that uh, every year. Uh, maybe again, but all those things people don't get the sense. I think in terms of base case, what you can do, and upside, what you have, and more importantly, probably growth opportunities that you have in many different ways, and still plenty of levers to pull to execute to continue to. At the margin, substantially improving this. Yeah, I'm really excited about the prospect going forward for our business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so why don't you tell us, you know, a couple of those that are. Yeah, so I mean, um, first off, I would say, because I think it's important, I mean, it's no fun turning around the business, right? I mean, yeah, the parts that, you know, look at what we did and everything, but, you know, it's a lot of heavy lifting. So now I think to your point, we're in a position to let's go have some fun and let's grow the business, right? right? So what are the growth opportunities? I mean, internally, so just organically, irrespective of where the price is in the marketplace. Right, right. As I mentioned, we can improve our operating rates from kind of low 90s to mid 90s. You know, at mid-market pricing, that probably generates another $25 million a year in EBITDA. Right. So we intend to capture that. Um, we've also got what we'll call margin enhancement projects. So those are our projects that produce or that increase production capacity, right? Because we have a finite production capacity right. with plants like that. We operate. Um, and so those margin improvement projects could be additional storage or installing loading racks in, a, in one plant site that we don't have them and therefore we can capture the logistic savings between one plant uh, production versus another. Right. Um, it could be um, increasing our ability to load so that we can be more efficient and faster or without um, could be self-loading racks where we don't need our own people to do that. Yeah. So there are a lot of different projects that, that we're working on. Um, keep in mind, they all have to have a really optimal return or they're not worth doing, right? So there's a big vetting process that we go through. But we think that um, the projects that we're sort of working, actively working on, you know, can probably generate another 10 to $15 million of annual EBITDA. Right. Um, so again, 35 to $40 million just from that. Right. The last I would say um, that takes us into a whole nother category and that is um, carbon capture. And so we do have two projects that we're working on and we're big believers and we can talk about why, but um, at our largest facility in Arkansas, um, we partnered with a, a company uh, called Lapis Energy that um, our experts in uh, I'd say subsurface geology, right? That's not our game. We don't want to operate injection wells or anything like that, uh, but that's uh, their background and expertise. And so we're going to um, put on um, carbon capture equipment. So we'll capture and then liquefy CO2, where we'll um, initially capture about 450,000 tons of CO2 um, and we'll inject it into a sequestration, a class six sequestration well on our property. And why is that important? It's important because many of the projects that are being talked about um, will have to sell CO2 to someone who then is going to transport it via pipeline 15, 20, 50 miles to get to a sequestration site that a lot of folks are building. Um, one, um, I think the EPA, I, I don't know this, but my guess would be the EPA will have to do a lot more rigorous due diligence on a sequestration site that's got a number of CO2 emitters coming in at potentially different pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're really focused on is the well itself and the casing of the well, right? They don't want the CO2 to get out, right? Otherwise it's not permanently sequestered and there could be other consequences. So our project's simple. It's on our 1400 acres that we own there. It's good to be lucky. We have two great saline formations right below our property. It's actually a, um, below our property um, are shut in wells, so there's a lot of geology on it as well. Right. And it's one emitter to, to one sequestration well. So the pipeline actually from our plant to the, to the proposed sequestration well is less than a mile. Right. So it's really economical. What does that do for us? A couple of things. One, it reduces our um, 
CO2 footprint as a company by 25%. Mm -hmm. So that project alone reduces our CO2 emissions by 25%. It then uh, allows us to capture um, the full $85 credit from the 45Q um, uh, uh, that's in um, the IRA Act um, that's out there. Um, so that'll generate at least initially probably $15 million of annual EBITDA at the $85 starting in 20, uh, 2026. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna be left with 375,000 tons or so of low carbon uh, or blue ammonia mm -hmm. uh, that we should be able to sell at some kind of premium to what we're selling today. Right. And that's an optionality. They don't have to do one or the other. Either you sell blue ammonia or you get the credit. No, you get both. Was? Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah. So we're excited about that because just capturing um, the CO2 and just taking advantage of the $85 per ton CO2 credit, mm -hmm. the 45 acute credit allows us, as I said, about 14, $15 million a year. So I mentioned 35 to 40 and 15 on that. And that's 50 to, uh, to $55 million of additional EBITDA. Yeah. Nothing to do with price. And that has no, no capital requirements on the part of LSB to do that. Yeah, the way we're set up now with Lapis, um, they're going to put up all the capital. Okay. There is, I mean, I, I don't want to say that we'll never invest capital. I think we're looking at the economics now as to whether it makes sense for us to put up the capital for the capture facility and on that incremental EBITDA that we would get. So, so the optionality is you don't have to put up anything and you get the 15 and you get blue ammonia. Correct. Or you have at some later date, the option to put up some capital based on a rate of return to get incremental value. Exactly, that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million. And so what's the return on that $25 million? What's the incremental EBITDA we can generate? Right. Right. Yeah, so optionality, we like optionality. So that sounds to me like a, a CO2 project that's extremely comprehensible that even a slow guy like me can understand, which is, you know, I hear a lot of carbon sequestration. I just don't know what that means and how to quantify it. And here, this is a great example of doing something that's clearly a great outcome for a great economic result. Yeah, I mean, um, we're not going out and building, at least today, we're not going out and building a million ton a year plant and and hopefully we can get offtake for all of that and, and or build a spec plant and hope they'll come. I mean, that's too speculative for us. Right. I think it's too speculative for anyone, quite right. frankly. Right. Yeah. So three different avenues of growth, all internal, all without increasing any production capacity, and 50 to $55 million sort of at mid-market pricing. So we're pretty excited about that. You know, then we start talking about um, debottlenecking. And I know everyone gets all nervous about debottlenecking and has had bad experiences with companies who have tried to debottleneck plants. It's actually pretty standard in our industry. It's been done a lot of times, um, but we want to be prudent about it and we want to be thoughtful about it. And does it make sense for us? And where does it make sense? And, you know, so we had a recent um, investor day um, where we laid out the bottlenecking and it was kind of the full Monty of what we might do. Um, but as we look at the economy and as we look at our industry and as we look at, you know, the risks associated with doing a full de bottlenecking throughout the El Dorado facility, you know, we'll weigh that and more than likely we'll pull back some and do it maybe in stages. And that's, of course, it gets the greater context of you know, a huge advantage for your industry is the fact that the feedstock is natural gas in North America. And the feedstock in North America, as people realized 10 years ago, was an opportunity that would be long dated, that continues to obviously be long dated. And you continue to see people moving to America to therefore make fertilizer here, seeing that opportunity. So, so the backdrop is extremely supportive for you. And the timing, as you say, is at your election and at your option as you determine how much free cash flow you have and where best to invest in. Yeah, and um, I think we're seeing a couple of things, all driven by, or primarily by low natural gas prices here relative to anywhere else around the world, yeah. right? You know, we think, well, gas is low today, but even when it went to five, six, seven dollars, it was still relatively low compared to others, right? It probably had a bigger spread then. It, it did. It got higher. <laughs> yeah. So, the world looks at that and says, okay, if I'm going to expand, right. um, where am I going to expand? Right. And it's really the U.S. So it helps us in a number of different ways. I mean, um, a lot of our industrial customers are now onshoring or expanding here. Right. That's good because hopefully that leads to more demand for us, right, for our products. Right. Um, why? Low natural gas costs, but quite frankly, easy to do business here. 
right? The political environment's pretty good versus maybe the Middle East where they have very cheap or free natural gas, right? I mean, so different dynamics make it really easy. So onshoring, um, labor, uh, the cost of labor and the, the availability of labor and, and technical labor, because I think what people don't realize and all these plants that, you know, new plants that are announced are all, you know, they may, they don't have the capital yet, most of them, but even if they did, who's going to run the plant? And who's going to, ammonia is a, a hazardous material, right. needs to be handled properly, stored properly, shipped properly. And so you need technical expertise to do all of that. And yeah. you can train people, but, right. you know, then you're dealing with kind of newly trained folks. So I think not just ourselves, but any ammonia producer today has a leg up on everyone else. Right that's talking about um, building or, or actually building brand new greenfield plants. Yeah. <laughs> Let me run back to, you really have built out a management team across the organization that yeah. enables you to have the people to execute in a very different place than when you took on the expansion of the area. Yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, I have a great management team. Um, they're all experienced. Um, they're all, you know, We've gelled. I mean, it's it's why are people here? Why you know? I always ask them all the time, why'd you come to the company? Like, I'm always curious. Like, maybe we can make it better. Maybe there's things we need to enhance. Um, but most people um, will say they came to the company because there's a lot of excitement around what we're doing. Um, it's easy to do business. We have a really easy platform to do business. Um, as I mentioned, there's no politics. It's flat. And quite frankly, one of the biggest things we pride ourselves on is we make decisions pretty quickly. A lot of companies, bigger companies and bigger competitors, it could take two weeks, three weeks to kind of make some decision. We get together, we sit down, we try and have the best information that we have and you make decisions and not every decision is going to be right, but you know, that's life and kind of then you change course, right? Right. Yeah. So people like coming to work here. So yeah, the management team that, that we have today that was built this way by design is to can run a much larger organization and that's really the, the focus the intention now now you did mention debottling and, and he talked about the savings and the opportunities that's there but that requires some capital yeah right and so i guess that's part of the equation in terms of how do you figure that out is that so yeah. how do you think about it yeah so i mean um so when you think about any debottlenecking project or even you know let's say we were to build uh, a replacement site or a new site uh or for a plant on el dorado so right so anything new or anything debottlenecked it's a project. So you got to think about, it starts with a feasibility study. So um, you do some work internally and then we hire, um, you know, a technology provider or an EPC contractor that we use. Um, we tend to um, um, like to use, or at least lately, a firm called Black & Peach, very well known um, in the industry. And so um, we work with them. They'll provide a feasibility study to us. We then refresh our models. We kind of look at the market and what do we think about cost? What do we think about the, the pricing that we have in our model going forward? Because um, we have to have a view on that. Um, then you go to what's called a pre-feed. Right. Um, and then that kind of um, includes some uh, engineering. Um, and so it kind of narrows down the plus or minus in any project, right? Then you kind of relook at things again. Um, and then you really um, sit down and have a more... Um, let's say healthy conversation and even with the board at that point, because next step would be really to do a full feed study, right? um, which generally takes, you know, nine to 12 months to do a feed study, depending on the size of the project or the complexity of the project. And then you kind of really now plus or minus, you know, call it 15%. And you're really deciding um, at that point, what's my final investment decision. Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm laying this out is, you know, this isn't, you're spending the capital, starting to spend, you know, globs of capital tomorrow. That's probably all of that from start to finish is probably a, a year and a half to two year process. So when we look at it, any debottlenecking that we would do, right, any big project uh, that were, would require a lot of capital, we're probably not spending that capital until 2025. We're sitting here in 2023. So we think about, you know, obviously um, timing of cash flows, right. timing of cash generation, and that goes into a whole uh, thought process when we're talking about capital allocation, right? So what do we do with the, the funds? How do we, how much cash do we want to keep on the balance sheet versus how much do we want to um, give back to shareholders in some manner? Um, and then you go from there. And, and, and of course, you've talked over the years and you've looked at 
uh, acquisitions M and A. So that's part of the opportunity set that I'm sure must be there. How do you? How does that enter into the equation? Oh uh, well, absolutely. Um, you know, um, I think as we take a step back and we go to a thirty thousand foot level for a second, mm -hmm. um, decarbonizing the world is going to happen. Um, it's got you and I are old enough to have lived through a couple of other I'll call them green waves. They were short lived. I think it was more country specific and it was more about nat the arbitrage between natural gas prices and some alternative form of energy. Right. Um, we know that from our geothermal heat pump business or right. HVAC business, right? So you look at that and all of a sudden gas prices come down and then no one really cared anymore. Today it's very different. Today, there's a global effort to decarbonize, and you've got governments around the world incentivizing people or taxing people, depending on the, the country um, or the union. You've got private capital, lots of private capital uh, with energy transition funds and infrastructure funds and all kinds of people wanting to get involved. Um, and, you know, when we look at it, um, I think hydrogen is extremely important. But you know, when you look at hydrogen versus ammonia, hydrogen has got some properties that um, really prop up ammonia. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen is really difficult uh, to transport. You can do it through pipeline, which is the most efficient, but pipelines, you can't go hundreds and hundreds of miles or thousands of miles on a pipeline. And you can't, it's not efficient to put hydrogen on a ship because actually hydrogen has to be stored um, at minus 247. Yeah, I think it's 247, you're right, um, where ammonia is like minus 30. You know, so one, it's much more difficult from a cryo perspective to do that for right. hydrogen, but also there's a lot of energy loss when you have to do that. Right. So people then, um, everything started with hydrogen, but people now have really transitioned to, we can use ammonia directly, or we can use ammonia as um, a transport medium for hydrogen, because what's in ammonia? Hydrogen, right? So you can decrack the hydrogen out of ammonia, and there's a lot of folks working on that technology, and very successfully. Um, and I would say within a, a year or two, um, we'll have some really good technology to do that. So when I take a step back and I look at where's the industry going, um, and, and ammonia as a fuel source or an energy source, I think it makes a lot of sense to own ammonia assets in the future. Um, so getting back to M&A. We absolutely look at things, um, whether there's an ammonia plant or opportunities for sale. Um, but you know, as you know, we're, um, we're pretty disciplined. We're not going to overpay for something. Um, when you look at these uh, assets, no one uh, buys at high in a high priced environment. No one sells at a low priced environment. So you have to really look at them as what's mid your view on mid market pricing and what's a fair price because you're going to own the asset for a long period of time. So absolutely, m and is something that we look at. Um, and quite frankly, I get the question all the time, well, how would you ever buy an asset? I mean, you're very well positioned and well capitalized, but assets cost usually, you know, billion, $2 billion. Like, how would you do that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of partners out there with lots of cash. Right. And we don't necessarily have to own 100% of an asset. Right. I'd like to own 51% and control the asset right. since we would operate it. Right. But I don't need to own 100%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, markets potentially give you opportunities when you're public companies also. Yeah. And so, uh, and of course, not so long ago, you did announce uh, looking at the idea and you bought back stock over time. Yeah. And so therefore that enters in because the market may, as I said, you can, buying a business probably is pretty close to fair value at mid-cycle. The public markets don't necessarily value the same way. Correct. And so how do you think about that? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, well, again, I, I'd like to think that um, values are recognized over time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, plants come available for sale, you're talking about just specifically that, um, that doesn't happen. You can't control the timing of it. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good asset with good attributes, it maybe has export capabilities and things like that. I think you just have to find a way to do that transaction because I think one and one should equal more than two, right, over time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's nice to talk about where the stock is today, but I, I tend to focus on you know, at least I think my job as CEO is where's the stock going to be three years from now, five years from now? Right. What's the strategy? Because, you know, at some point I'll leave 
you know, I'll leave my chair and I'll leave a legacy to someone else. And our job is to, CEO's job, I think, is to um, build long-term sustainable shareholder value, right? Agreed. Don't do our thing today. <laughs> you know, the other thing we mentioned, you know, you mentioned stock buyback. So we did buy $175 million worth of stock last year, um, which we were really excited about. We did recently announce another, oil authorized another $150 million of stock buyback. Uh, you know, I don't think you're going to go out there and see us running to buy, you know, 100 or $150 million of stock. I think we'll be opportunistic about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's absolutely on the table. But then we talked about leverage earlier. Um, so we have $700 million of debt. Um, you know, as uh, Cheryl McGuire, our CFO, has talked about uh, wanting to be uh, no more than two and a half times leverage. And that's absolutely the focus. And it has to be for a business like ours. That's still commodity today, right? right where prices can shift. So if you think about mid-market, even of 200 million, that would put debt around $500 million. So that is another consideration when we think about it. Um, we'd like to all, over time reduce our debt down to $500 million. Unless some outstanding project came along that would provide additional or incremental EBITDA that yeah, would right. support a higher level of debt, right? Yeah. But absent that, I think we will be opportunistic in, in how we do that. And of course, um, we have an opportunity, although our bonds traded a discount today, October of, of next year. So one year from this October, the bonds are callable at 103. Mm -hmm. um, so we, of course, we can... If nothing else, we could wait until uh, until then. To do and that. what is the official? What's the maturity date? What's the interest rate on the Yeah, so the rate today is uh, six and a quarter, mm -hmm. and it matures in uh, May of twenty, uh, uh, actually September of twenty twenty eight. And and it trades uh, slightly below par. Uh, yeah, about ninety or ninety one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't think that's a reflection of the company. I think it's a reflection of when we refinanced, we got a really good rate and interest rates have moved yeah, up right. Right. eight times. <laughs> yeah. So the industry itself, of course, uh, is changing. So you know, there are some transactions. How do you think about that? Because the industry in the past sometimes is overbuilt. Yeah. You know, what's the risk today of overbuilding? Because you do have projects that have been announced and there's changes on the way. Yeah. So um I mentioned earlier that in the 2012 to 2015 timeframe, there were like 36 different projects in Amsterdam and only yeah. seven got done. Um, why didn't the others get done? Um, couldn't get financing, couldn't get permitting. Um, after going through the feasibility, pre-feed, feed study, you know, costs went up pretty dramatically. Right. Lots of different reasons why they didn't get done. Um, so now we get to fast forward to today and there's a whole lot of projects that have been announced um, in the Gulf, particularly Louisiana, um, and then um, certainly in, in Texas, both outside of Houston and around Houston, and then down in Corpus Christi. Right. Um, so when you look at, at all of those plants, um, many of them have yet to, to do a pre-feed, no less a feed. Mm -hmm. um, my intuition and my suspicion is, is that many of the people that are related with those sites are smart people. So, you know, again, to spend, Two billion dollars to build a million ton a year blue ammonia plant mm -hmm. from scratch, mm -hmm. or even on someone's site that's got some infrastructure, but there's no existing ammonia plant there. Um, you know, two billion dollars going through that. Most of the folks um, will be prudent and want to have a majority of that production locked up in true offtake agreements. So that to, to, to us, that means true take or pay. Not a LOI for you know um, some number of tons because that doesn't really mean anything. What you really need to have is a take or pay, come hell or high water. Right. They're taking the product at an index price or some fixed price, okay. and then you can finance that. So um, most folks today are talking to, as are we, uh, Japanese buyers and South Korean buyers, who those two governments have been very aggressive in wanting to reduce their car their CO2 emissions by using around 20 or up to 30%, at least initially, um, of the uh, power for uh, power generation, right? So their turbines, the power of the turbines in ammonia. Mm -hmm. um, so, but everyone's chasing the same uh, kind of off-takers, right? So there aren't enough off-takers, enough tons to support all those plants. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, uh, again, 
Um, ammonia producers lived through this, as you said, back in 2012 to 2015. I think most of us have learned a lesson of, of not overbuilding. Mm -hmm. There could be some folks that um, maybe have the capital and really wanted to put it to use and they're okay with maybe building and they will come and, and taking a loss. I don't think there are going to be many of those. Right. So it's possible we could see some slight overbuilding um, until the demand catches up. And then quite frankly, I think the demand flows past the supply right. and then we'll have to backfill with more plants, but that would be a great problem to have. And, and, and to back up, because that's again, the optionality, the free call that you get kind of on this business today, right? Because uh, uh, ammonia is potentially really a new part of the energy equation. Right. And therefore the demands for ammonia are gonna be substantially different than where they are historically industrial fertilizers. And so that's, that's a free call that I would think that you know you potentially participate in and be able to put capital and even if you don't put capital into it, the fact that the end market is substantially increasing for ammonia your product. Yeah, I mean we we fully expect to participate in right. some way, right? We've got our two projects. I didn't even mention uh, the one up at Pryor, which is um, you know uh, using electrolyzers to make green ammonia. Right. A small project doing that, right. but. Yeah, I think there's a great opportunity for us today. It's a nascent industry, so it doesn't matter if you're the largest player in the industry or, you know, a, a, a smaller player like us. There are no tons being sold to this alternative demand. So everyone's got free dibs on that, right? Right. So, um, yeah, I think, um, as you mentioned, we've got a lot of opportunity to grow the base platform. And then our focus over time will be, and, and I think you and the rest of the investment community will see us really try and morph what I call a traditional meat and potatoes nitrogen chemical business to become a low uh, low carbon products producer that you know kind of feeds the world right through low carbon fertilizer or no carbon fertilizer um, powers the world or uh, provides products to the consumer ultimately to the consumer through our industrial customers right yeah and and, and again in my mind the base opportunity is predicated on the fact that in North America, there is a substantial supply of natural gas, which trades at a discount to all our energy sources around the world. And that supply is long dated, and therefore that cost advantage should persist, and therefore give volatility for persistent earnings to North American based ammonia producers, fertilizer producers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah from, a, from a cost of production standpoint, we're all the way at the left, which is the lowest cost of the cost curve. Right. Yep. And then you also mentioned that too, because you said if there were acquisitions or things, and uh, that would give you ability for export, but that also is part of the equation, which again ties into the fact that we'll be able to produce here in North America and export to the world. And therefore, not only is it domestic consumption, uh, which is also going to be strong and growing, but there's also the export market that uh, are part of the equation. For the foreseeable future. Yeah, so let's put things in perspective, right? About, um, there's about 180 million tons a year of ammonia production mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. Most of it's um, all upgraded to other products. Mm -hmm. And about and so about 20 million of the 180 uh, trades on the open market mm -hmm. on an annual basis. Um, between um, Japanese and South Korean potential um, power demand or demand to, to generate power. And then the other industry would be the marine industry who, you know, as you know, right, is, is an extremely dirty and CO2 emitting um, industry. And there's a lot of focus as an industry on decarbonizing. Right. Um, you know, that could be between those two, we could be talking about uh, potentially doubling ammonia demand. So another 180 million tons a year mm -hmm. of demand. Mm -hmm. And clearly we don't have the supply for that today. Right. Mark, what else do I miss? Nothing. We're, you know, as I said, I think we're really excited about the opportunities that we have. Um, you know, we just plug along, and um, I think you'll see um, some more activity in the clean energy space. And as I mentioned, we've got two projects. But I really think, you know, and, and we as a as a management team need to sit back and think about okay, what's our clean energy strategy, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, just it's nice to have two projects. And so, how do we how do we view this new demand, um, the um, 
the, the, where will the supply be? How do we take advantage of that? Um, and how do we play a significant role in that? Um, and as I said, you know, we're not arrogant enough to, to have to do everything ourselves. So we're big on partnerships. So I think you'll see us partner with folks to, you know, um, to maybe have more production, uh, more assets, uh, more offtake. I mean, I think we, there's a lot of optionality as to have directions we could go. Uh, so you have a couple things, right? You did the invested day back in March. Yeah. Right? I didn't have the recording of that. It's almost like three hours and it's great. And you have the person who's the head of clean energy that you hired specifically, a the person covering yep. that. So therefore it talks about it. So therefore I kind of encourage people to kind of go back, look at those things. There's a lot of information. Um, so any other opportunities for people to kind of like hone in on some of these things to get more granularity? Oh, well, our uh, Cheryl McGuire will be at the uh, Stiefel. Um, there's, there's a, a multi-industry conference up in right. Boston in, in June. Mm -hmm. um, so she's got a good schedule and she's also doing a, a you know, a, a, a fireside chat. Have you have you seen that? Because I remember so way back when uh, there was a, a Boston-based uh, uh, environmentally sensitive fund that was invested in LSB. Because uh, maybe it was Barry who told me at the time it was interesting. Because you know we had the geothermal, you had the climate master geothermal heat pumps and heat pumps, and so this was great. But he also chuckled at the idea, like, well, we also make nitric acid that goes into mountaintop mining and explosives. So therefore, that kind of dichotomy. Anyway, today you really are in a position where you know there's a lot of things in energy transition that there's a real opportunity set. So it would just seem as a you know that's kind of I don't you know I am not in the camp that wants to invest in green energy or green things, but the fact of the matter is. That's a huge opportunity we've seen for you that will bring economic growth. And you already have the Lapis project where someone else is spending the money. And you know, and the projects you have prior, again, testing out how to do you know, green hydrogen. So therefore, there's all these things that uh, it seems as if you're getting a free look at a lot of really great opportunities for growth and where the world's moving. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, we've been fielding more and more calls uh, from, I'd say, uh, institutional money managers and funds that are focused on right. energy transition or decarbonization right. as we're getting on people's radar screens. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so, you know, we know a lot of the, you know, we partnered with Bloom Energy yeah, right. uh, right. up at Prior, so, right. you know, we're very familiar with them. So we, we get a chance to look at, at, you know, the Plug Powers, the Bloom Energies, you know, a lot of these other companies, right. all great companies. Um, I think we're an interesting play because you know we're profitable, uh, cash flow generating, right. um, where maybe others are earlier right. stage than us, and um, and we've got a, a really um, big part of our business that really we believe we can grow to um, you know to a low carbon uh, you know producer or or just take advantage of this whole uh, energy transition. Well, that's right. People are willing to invest in green energy things and pay a very high price for. Very difficult economics. Here, you can do it at a discounted price and have a huge amount of, of embedded opportunities and things that are adjacencies as opposed to new directions and things. Yeah, Mike, right. we'd like to see hopefully uh, the, uh, the market values the stock where we think is, is more of a fair value. And so we're not talking about it at a discount. Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I do have, uh, Spencer, you have any questions? Yeah, we, we have a few questions. Um, so, so one here is, you know, CF Industries, right, recently purchased that uh, Wagaman plant for, call it 1.7 billion. You know, it has the same kind of capacity as LSB's portfolio of ammonia plants and, and lacks the upgrading uh, potential to enhance margins. You know, the he, he noted he heard a lot of interest in buying nitrogen assets on, on this call. So with LSB having an enterprise value of just over a billion dollars, why is it not a seller's market? Why does it make sense to participate in the buyer's market with such a low valuation on LSB right now? I can't really speak on why are we not a seller. I don't think um, we, we feel like there's a lot of value creation uh, still left over the next two or three years uh, or four years for our company. And as Bob has said repeatedly, we're at a discounted value today. Um, so I don't think we'd really be interested in selling at today's prices. Um, having said that, you know, we're a public company, and if someone wanted to make a coming off, you know, make an offer, I mean, we'd always have to listen, right? I mean, I think that's our responsibility. But um, maybe at some point in time, we make sense uh, for someone to uh, to purchase us in the future. 
Um, I don't know that it makes sense today. Um, as far as buying others, um, look, I think there are ways to do it which would be accretive to us. So I, I guess I want to be clear. Um, I mentioned that we're pretty disciplined in how we look at things. Um, we're not going to buy an asset that's um, shareholder destructive. So we're not going to buy it that's, that's really dilutive uh, to shareholder value. So you know, if we can buy an asset at, you know, at, at our view of what we think it's really worth, that makes sense for us, that increases our ammonia production capacity and maybe has some other attributes that we find attractive for us, uh, we would do that. Uh, absent that, you know, we're just not going to buy assets for the sake of being larger. What's the differential? So if uh, if CF is buying that facility and paying one point seven billion, uh, how much more efficient is it? Brand new plant, uh, one location versus you have three locations. What's what's the trade off in that process? As to someone setting a price, is the value of your assets worth more or less than one point seven? Assuming that's the right price to pay that CF is buying. Yeah, I mean, I think it, so. Clearly, um, one large plant that has the production capability of R3 is going to be more efficient from a cost perspective because you don't need three times the amount of people to run that plant right. than you do R3, right? right? So that's absolutely true. But there are other attributes, you know, um, what's the efficiency of the gas conversion efficiency? Um, what contracts do they have? You might have contracted profitability out of the plant, right? So there's a lot of other things that go into the evaluation of a plant other than you know, just what's the cost of production, yeah. right? Yeah. Spencer, you have other questions? You said, uh, yeah. So, so I got another one here. So, how do you think about the normalized premiums of of AN and nitric acid over UAN going forward? And then I think, you know, in addition to that, could you maybe just sort of talk about some of your other, you know, products versus sort of basic ammonia? Um, and I know kind of in, in the investor day, you, you kind of talked about increasing production of, of UAN and, and some of your other products. Um, so maybe touching on that would be helpful as well. Yeah. So I mean, as I mentioned, ammonia is the basic building block, uh, but most of our ammonia gets upgraded to other products. Um, so at uh, two of our facilities, both in Pryor and in Cherokee, uh, Alabama, um, we upgrade most of our ammonia to UAN. Uh, so we produce about 550 to 575,000 tons of UAN and UAN trades at a premium to ammonia on a nitrogen content basis, right? So they, you know, each, each of these products have different nitrogen uh, percentages or content, you know, uh, uh, nitrogen content in them. So you have to normalize to compare apples to apples, but usually um, it's always trading at a premium. Otherwise you wouldn't upgrade. It wouldn't make sense to, to spend the cost to do that. Um, same thing. Um, with AN, which is made out of our El Dorado facilities. So we make um, ammonia there and we upgrade it to nitric acid and actually we're the largest merchant marketer of nitric acid in North America. Uh, so we do, we've been for a long time, we're known for it and we've got large global uh, chemical customers for that product. But most of that nitric acid um, is upgraded to ammonium nitrate uh, where we either sell ammonium nitrate solution or we sell a, a prilled product, which is a pelletized product, um, about 250 to 300,000 tons that go uh, to the ag market as fertilizer, and about 140 or 50,000 tons of a prilled product that gets sold um, into the mining industry that they use uh, as a, an ingredient for an emulsion or a mix that they use for blasting. Um, and those products sell at a premium to ammonia as well. Um, we like the optionality that we have in all the markets, as I mentioned earlier. Um, having optionality in markets and being able to optimize our production is really what our commercial strategy is all about. Um, we're pretty agnostic as to what product we sell. Um, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but we're not farmers. We, don't, we didn't grow up, we don't own farms. Um, and rather than saying we're a fertilizer producer, we tend to say we're a chemical manufacturer because again, we're agnostic about uh, where the product goes. So, um, you know, we sell uh, other, some other products on smaller scale, um, but those are the basic and main products that we sell. Great. Um, and, then, and then we had another one sort of, you know, as a smaller company, kind of how do you think, 
you, you can go about becoming a meaningful player in, in the emerging market for low and, and no carbon ammonia? And just how do you kind of remain kind of competitive there? Well, um, as I mentioned, um, we've got our one project at El Dorado, and I don't think demand really begins for um, for low carbon ammonia, yeah, and probably until you know end of twenty six or even early twenty twenty seven. And and when I say demand, meaningful demand, um, because of the simplicity of our project, um, and the simplicity being that um, the wells on our property, so we don't have to deal with right of ways or anything like that. Um, and we're, it's only one emitter going into, um, you know, one injection well, um, we'd like to think that the EPA will view it the same and that, um, our class six permit, um, gets really due consideration. And so in theory, we could be one of the first out there, um, if not the first, uh, to be in a position to export low carbon ammonia to, to the tune of two or 300,000 tons a year, which, you know, that could be in um, late 2025 or early 2026. So important because it's probably before you know any meaningful demand starts to kick in. And so I think that there will be some buyers that would like to have and commit to smaller amounts of ammonia before they commit to larger offtake agreements. And I think that puts us in a really good position. So initially, I think we've got um, some first mover advantage that uh, we, we might be able to really take advantage of. Then when it comes to, to how do we play a meaningful role um, in the industry itself, um, you're right. Um, we're in great financial shape, but we're still small relative to the scale and size and cost of these plants. So that's about partnerships and that's about partnering with other industry players or quite frankly, um, you know, private equity players that either run energy transition funds or infrastructure funds and lots of them all looking for established opportunities. And many of them like to partner with operators um, that act where they can make their investment. And usually um, when they work hard to find a partner uh, to partner with, um, it's always better for them to work on multiple transactions and, and opportunities than just one and have to find new players each time. So I think we will have opportunities to really partner with folks. I mean, for instance, CF announced that they were partnering with Mitsui on a brand new plant um, that's an industry player. It could have easily just have been uh, a private equity fund and, and some form of private capital. And and have the the big oil majors and, and companies done done stuff with uh, ammonia yet? Or are they are they starting to explore um, that space? Or, or what what has that been like? Yeah, so um, it's it's kind of interesting because. Um, we believe that ammonia will be part of the energy value chain. I think it's just a matter of time. And I, I think the big integrated feel the same. So they've made investments in hydrogen and Exxon actually announced the plant um, in conjunction with a few other partners. I believe it's outside of a brand new plant outside of Corpus Christi. Um, so I think they're the first one um, in the US uh, or first one that I've seen to announce a plant in the US Although Uniper, that's an energy company in Europe, large energy, a German energy company has announced in partnership with others, uh, a plant in the Gulf as well. Um, if you think about it, Exxon owned ammonia plants 40, 50 years ago, um, and then they got rid of them. Um, so I do see that coming full circle as ammonia becomes more and more entrenched over time um, as part of a, uh, the energy value chain. They want to own those assets. All right, I think that's all the uh, the questions we had. Um, do you want to make any closing remarks, or, or Bob, did you have any uh, final questions or, or things to talk uh, about? Well, I guess, uh, uh, sure, Mark, do you have any closing thoughts? No, I appreciate everyone's interest. Um, you know, we're really focused on um, being disciplined, both uh, financially disciplined um, and prudent uh, on our balance sheet, uh, making prudent investments and, and getting the right returns. And really thinking about, you know, how do we balance allocation of capital, you know, kind of internal growth, external growth through um, other opportunities, and then uh, return of capital to shareholders in some form. So we're excited about the opportunities. Um, we think over time, um, we can create a lot of value for shareholders, and uh, we hope you uh, we, we hope you become shareholders, if not already.
And, and I'd close with, uh, you know, we have been shareholders and clearly the company's been transformed. Uh, balance sheet's in a very different place today. The cash flows are strong and positive and uh, permanently. Opportunity sets significant. The people are different and therefore the opportunity to capture those. It's not just dollars that come in, but people understanding and executing well in the business. So, uh, and the valuation is extremely discounted from our point of view, from what the cash flows of the business will be over the next five years. So uh, we think it's an extremely compelling situation that the market doesn't understand for many different reasons, including the, it being small cap, so people don't care. The reality is the cash is there, people won't care. The other will carry out cash. So thanks for joining us. Uh, take care, bye-bye. And then re reach out with any questions to uh, ir at robotti.com and we can uh, try and have those answered. Thanks, Brinson. Bye-bye.